folks. I would like to uh, introduce the panel that we have uh, following Vikram's talk, and I welcome all of our panelists on stage. Thanks everyone for joining us here today. My name is Madison Swain Bowden, and I am a staff data engineer at Automatic. Um, I have been using, I've been a member of the Airflow community since 2017. Um, Vikram's talk was packed with information, uh, and we wanted to move into a discussion about what some aspects of Airflow 3 look like and what we would like as the future of Airflow. So can I ask each of you panelists to introduce yourself and um, talk about how you've been involved in your efforts around Airflow 3. We'll start with Kaksh. Hello. Yeah, um, I'm Kaksh Nag, the Senior Director of Engineering at Astronomer, but more importantly, uh, one of the committers and PMC members of Airflow from five and a half or six years. I think long before uh, I joined Astronomer, I was involved with Airflow as a user first. I was a data engineer. Uh, I was writing a lot of ETL-related operations like you all are doing. Um, slowly and steadily got into the project, loved open source, and have never even thought about leaving it after that. So it's been such a rewarding journey, and to see 600 plus people over here right now, it has been just a pleasure. Airflow 2 was pivotal to the project, like Vikram was mentioning, and I'm looking forward for Airflow 3. I think I'll include Airflow in my introduction, but I think that's fine. <laughs> I'm Shubham Mehta, and I'm Senior Product Manager at AWS. I work directly with the team making upstream contribution to Apache Airflow, and I'm kind of responsible for what they, how they prioritize, what they prioritize, and where they contribute. So directly or indirectly, we have been involved with Airflow 3 since the beginning in terms of prioritization and then in terms of execution for some of the key features. And I'm really excited about the new use cases that Airflow 3 will bring. Hey, my name is Michal Modras. I'm engineering manager at Google Cloud Composer. And I've been involved with the Airflow 3 discussions from the very beginning. We talked about um, the scope, functionalities, architectural changes you want to bring, the bottlenecks you want to remove, and enabling Airflow 4 uh, for the great future. And my name is Constance, and I'm a senior product manager at Astronomer. I primarily work with Caxel and the open source team. Uh, so similar to Shubham, uh, a lot of my contributions are really around you know, what the new features look like in Airflow and the upstream contributions that the open source team at Astronomer makes. Got it. Thank you all. As a direct follow-up to Vikram's talk, it seems like there are uh, four major themes when we're talking about Airflow 3. Remote and edge execution, uh, temporality, tasks in other languages, and then usability features. So I wanna kind of dive into each one of those and talk about what each of those aspects look like. So starting with remote execution, this is a great extension to Airflow, um, and I've seen discussion about this a lot on the dev list, but what kinds of users have been asking for this capability and why? Can we start with Shubham? So remote execution is something that I don't think people realize that that's that Airflow could actually go in that direction. So I wouldn't say that people ask for it directly, so I do want to give credit to Jens for coming up with the idea that we should actually build remote and edge executor. But in terms of use cases that I see it enabling, that the number one being we have organizations which are actually scheduling workflows across regions, ac across hybrid cloud, across on-prem, like having on-prem systems as well. And these organizations, they have a strict data residency requirements. They want to do the execution where actually data is produced, where, data, where the data resides. And remote execution would make that possible. So that's one use case. The second one that I see it actually helping out is with optimization of some of the workflows. Because now you're not bringing in data to process in the cloud because you could actually do it. And I was talking to Jens yesterday, like how, why he came up with this idea. So Bosch has this autonomous team which, ha which is having a decent hardware on these vehicles. So they want to process the data where the data is being collected and they can process it there itself. They don't need to bring it in in the cloud and then do the processing. The third one I see it is enabling migration from tools like Autosys and Control-M because a lot of these users, they are doing execution on-prem. And these users, they want to do phase migration. They don't want to be like, okay, tomorrow I want to adopt Airflow and I'll write 10,000 pipelines and I'll 
it doesn't work like that. You need to have some transition plan. And what remote execution would allow them is they can do a continue execution where they are doing the execution right now, but they can start build, like using Airflow for orchestrating the same scripts that they are executing today, and then slowly move those scripts over in their journey for cloud modernization. Yeah, I, want, I wanted to add a few things on that, because uh, AIP69, which is the remote execution stuff, and the task execution interface, there's a lot of synergies within it. Like, imagine you can now run things remotely, but now run it in any language that helps a lot of users who have been asking, like, since Airflow's inception, how can I run Airflow reliably on Windows machine? I've tried, failed, I've tried WSL, it fails. What can we do? So I think one of the use cases will be Windows as well, like running on Windows-like systems. And the second one is the Gen AI use cases, which I will talk about it in more detail in two hours. I have a talk about it, but I'll give some highlights, uh, just some brief details, um, uh, brief, which Vikram already covered in the last talk, which is, so for some of the tasks, you want to utilize CPU. For some, you want to utilize GPU. And this will allow running those sort of workloads on your GPU machine, and some of the Gen AI data, like we know, can process really sensitive data. You don't want them to be running on a different uh, environment. So that will also be enabled. Thank you both. Vikram spoke about the need for removing the task's uh, necessity for contacting the Metastore. Um, how do you see, I mean, we've talked about this a little bit, but how do you see this changing what kinds of workflows can be run and how they can be run? Let me start with Michal. Yeah, I think it's not just about new types of workflows and enabling a lot of features that we can, uh, we can build on top, like enforcing controls and others, uh, but actually this is improvement for all the tasks and all the workflows that we run with Airflow, as this will significantly reduce the chattiness of Airflow components talking to the database, uh, which can become bottleneck at times because of a lot of connections you can have or a lot of CPU load you generate or whatnot. So uh, I see this as an improvement for any workflow really in Airflow. Yes, and I mean, further to that, so Vikram spoke about the whole client-server architecture that we're going to be bringing in. And so for anybody who has managed an Airflow for a team of data scientists, um, you know, you can, you, I imagine that you experience a lot of pain when it comes to upgrades. And so with having two separate distributions and having the Airflow components be one distribution and workers being uh, powered by, by Airflow SDKs, uh, administrators can easily upgrade Airflow components whenever there's new bug fixes or CVEs that need to be applied without impacting data teams. And data teams can upgrade as they see fit on their own schedule when it makes sense for them. Yeah, I just want to tap in on Mihal's point because like DB-related issues I've seen from Airflow's inception again, like everyone runs into DB contention at scale. And even at Astromas, we see some of the customers really testing the limits of database and we are then helping them upgrade the databases and stuff. But Ash did a POC recently for his talk and he was able to reduce the database connections from 100 to like five. That's a huge improvement and that will help a lot. So a lot of you folks who are maintaining Airflow uh, as a DevOps person in your company, you'll be pleased to see this coming. In. Yeah, I remember experiencing <laughs> connection <laughs> issues with Postgres, and it was the first yeah. time that I had ever encountered something like that. And so this really does seem like it's a pretty far-reaching oh, yeah. change. I imagine that also impacts like multi-team and multi-tenancy. So yeah, that's what I wanted to add at the last point. I think many people don't realize task isolation is one of the core feature required to enable a multi-team deployment. There is no, like you can't have a true multi-team setup when you have security issues or things like, like when one task from one team can interfere with other tasks from other teams. The isolation actually enables it and the, oh sorry, the, the, way, the way we are doing it is by like issuing JWT token to task and actually scoping them down so that they don't access the things that they are not supposed to access, makes everything in Airflow much more secure and enables the multi-team deployment. I mean, I think the one takeaway, at least that I'm getting from this and that I hope you really internalize, is that this AIP really has far-reaching consequences, but also benefits in so many different areas, whether you're an administrator, whether you're a user, or whether you're an enterprise running Airflow and have many different places that you need to connect to. Yeah, this is huge for enterprises, like, because you can run Python, so it's like, well, you can run anything, you can get anything from your database, and 
what is secrets then? If I am adding secrets for my team, for my DAG, and you can utilize it in your DAG, how am I even supposed to know all of those? So this will help creating a good audit of all those things and say, well, you cannot use this connection in your DAG because you don't have permissions. That makes sense, thank you. So moving on to one of the, the, the second core aspects, the temporality, what is the a scope of event-driven uh, scheduling and airflow, and like, will this require running new components? What is the uh, event-driven architecture going to look like? And we'll start with Shubham. Yeah, so event-driven scheduling has actually evolved a lot over the years. So if you all, like you have been following Airflow's journey for quite a long time, we started with sensors. Then came deferable operators to make sensors more asynchronous and make the execution better. Then came data-driven scheduling, but one thing that we realized is when people were using data-driven scheduling, they were not always producing the data set in the same Airflow environment or Airflow instance. They were having these dependencies from ex on external data sets, but it was not happening in the same environment itself. And that's why we started thinking that how can we actually enable something like that where you can depend on external resources. You want to build out these event-driven architectures, but you don't always have those things being produced in the same year, for instance. So what we are doing with event-driven scheduling is in your DAX, you would be able to define, okay, this is the data set and it depends on, and with this, like, you can associate some watcher or a pol polar with that data set, which will check, check whether the state has changed or not. And whenever there is a state change, it logs the event in the airflow and basically uses the data-driven scheduling to schedule that DAG. So, the, the thing that I love about this feature is like all these components already existed. We have triggers with deferable operators which are actually, which act as watchers for external resources. We already have data-driven scheduling and data set events. What event-driven scheduling is doing is bringing all these things together in order to unlock a lot more use cases. So it's not like, it's not very implementation heavy feature, but the, the things that it can enable, enable are gonna be huge. I was gonna say, it sounds a lot like the data sets that I've heard so much about uh, at this Airflow Summit. And so I'm just curious what the difference is for users in Airflow 3, like how that differs from data sets. So the main thing is you will have, so in the data sets will be there and in Airflow 3, we will actually allow data sets to cater to not just the storage, but also machine learning models and all, like we are evolving data sets into assets. And you will be able to depend on a lot more type of external resources as, as opposed to just an URI, which represents a storage system. Yeah, Constance, I, I wonder if you might be able to explain yeah, absolutely. the concept of the data asset. Like, okay. Absolutely. I mean, definitely this has been my baby, and this is something that I'm super excited about. Um, shameless plug, TP and I do have a talk about this at 1230 today, so if you're interested, please come see it. Uh, so data sets is something that we're bringing into Airflow, as Shubham mentioned, in our, and we're expanding data sets today to encompass different use cases such as machine learning models and so on and so forth. One of the key things I'm super excited about though is that we're introducing the concept of partitions and uh, partitions are meant to represent the slice of data that a task has worked with. So I don't know, I mean, I've written many pipelines prior to coming to Astronomer and one of the things for my pipelines is that you know, I'd be interacting with uh, data sets that were working on different temporalities. So I have perhaps a daily ETL with a daily DAG that is processing daily data, and then once a week is aggregating that into weekly data. What I used to do is I'd rely, like probably like many of you, on the execution date to figure out what range of data I needed to work with, and, and that was fine. But the disadvantage of this is that Airflow had no understanding of the data that I was, or the ranges that I was working on, and therefore couldn't tell me the impact on different data sets uh, that it would have. Like let's say I did a backfill um, you know, from a week earlier. There was no way to say that that backfill now would have a, an impact on the weekly aggregation data set that I was also working with. So with the concept of partitions, um, that, that's going to allow me to essentially ha have data assets and have different temporalities defined at that level. So it's no longer necessarily going to be driven by the DAG and the DAG schedule. It'll be really driven by the data set that I'm working with. 
once we have that visibility, I mean, really the world is your oyster. You can have block level lineage. You can make orchestration based on data quality and data freshness. And ultimately speaking, I'll have a much more robust um, data operations. It's been very cool to see Airflow evolve in that way because I remember the execution date and the, uh, the start date and the window date and whatnot were, were all these finicky things that you had to um, consider when you were writing these DAGs. And so it sounds like um, we're taking all of that mental load out of uh, uh, the DAG authors and the, the, the data engineers and the people who use Airflow as an orchestrator to be able to just be smarter about the stuff that they're working with, which is really cool. I peeked at the schedule and we have at least six or seven talks on, on Gen AI. And so in, this way, uh, in the wake of this age of AI that we find ourselves in, what aspects of Airflow 3 are able to help meet the demands of AI? Michal? So to start with, it is already happening, right? Airflow 2 is already serving the AI use cases at, at scale with uh, growing, growing popularity. Uh, we see a lot of LM provider use, uh, usage. We see a lot of uh, vertex operators from Google provider use as well. So people are orchestrating using Q on Kubernetes or other, other uh, jobs, um, the, 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 their AI wor uh, workflows. With Airflow 3, I believe this will be elevated to, to new heights uh, because of a few functionalities that we come with. One, we sort of already touched on the remote execution and executing these uh, um, operators related or tasks related to AI in GPU heavy clusters where you have all the resource you need for, for your execution, uh, but also managing bug fields in a controlled way in a more advanced way from the scheduler. So, yeah. Yeah, the removal of execution date is also going to enable a lot of experimentation that you can do with this whole explosion of all these AI models and LLMs and SLMs and whatnot. So that will help a lot with um, experimentation and with data assets. And if an ML model becomes a data asset, you can track all of those things in the UI and uh, know which model performed better than the other things. And that's a big step forward in, in my opinion from, for Airflow. Sounds like for that aspect, you, you have a talk that's going Ex on later Exactly. Today. That's and why I'm just hinting towards it and not giving all the details. So please do come in. And I think today in Airflow, like we've talked with customers, they already have training and evaluation pipelines residing in Airflow. They are already using Airflow to train their models and then evaluate them on periodic basis and all. But what we heard from customers, if they want to do anything on inference, like if it's a batch inference, Airflow can do it today. Yeah. But if they want to do anything that they want to request to an API and get the response, that's not, those use cases are not easily possible. Of course, you can, it's a Python and you can do anything in under the sun. But it is not intuitive to define inference pipelines in Airflow today. With Airflow 3, with some of the work that Vikram and team is doing, that would become easier. Got it. Uh, another core piece of Airflow 3 is the, the tasks in other languages. And what are the use cases that you envision here and which, which user conversations prompted this sort of thing? Yeah, one of the conversations that Vikram and I had was that he already covered in, in the talk. So Vikram, you stole my thunder. But uh, <laughs> one of the uh, customers with, that we talked to, they wanted to use machine learning. They wanted to do a lot of machine learning stuff, but they are a Kotlin heavy shop and it's like, well, with Python, we are going to use bash operator, then we lose a lot of exit codes, a lot of visibility into what's happening, debugging becomes a nightmare. So do, will we ever have first class support or do we need to hack into bash operators and stuff? Like, yeah, that's not intuitive. Um, we'll, we'll do better and have first class support for it. And then we bumped into someone else who said, we are utilizing TypeScript uh, for ML. Uh, we are building text to speech AI, API and application on top of it. How are we going to make it work with that? Will, our team don't, are not that heavy on Python. They can make it work if we have to, but do we want to force them? That's a different story. So like as the teams are evolving, rather than forcing them to learn a language, give them the opportunity to just code it in the language that they know, and uh, Airflow will help that transpile that in a lot of different ways, and where we can't, we'll create SDKs uh, to better support that. Yeah, and I mean, one of the things that we've heard from customers as well is that you know migrations are hard, and anything that we can do to help people migrate is a win. So imagine you're using a different system, and you have a bunch of scripts that are written in Java, for example. Uh, I mean, today, as it, as uh, Katzel alluded, we have the Bosch, Bash operator, and you can definitely package it up. 
but it is much simpler for people to you know, go ahead, import an SDK, add a few lines of code, and keep really the existing logic as is, making migration so much easier. Yeah, the, I, the prevalence of the bash operator in the Airflow survey was really interesting to see, and it, it is, has been nice to have that as a backdoor that we can, is always accessible, but I'm sure that um, it's great to see Airflow evolving past the need, uh, or evolving to need these you know, more integrated features. Exactly, and we will be looking for feedback, because right now the concept of multi-language is on a task basis, and we would be hoping to get some feedback and see how that is going on, because if it goes well, and if community receives that well, we want to do that for DAG level as well, so that you don't even need to write it a DAG in Python. So it's a natural evolution. So when he was talking about the data set stuff, we talked about data sets last year in last Airflow Summit, and all of these questions about, hey, but we can't pull external data sets. So the feedback is helpful. Like one year down the line, we are building on that. So please try it out. Let us know what works, what does not work. Both good and bad helps. Before we move on to the usability features, I want to talk a little bit about performance. Um, one big performance shift that I saw in the past through my use of Airflow was separating out the DAG processing into a separate process. How has that, and how has DAG processing and, and DAG ingestion changed in Airflow 3? So again, to, to start with, uh, the performance profile of Airflow 3 will not be just slightly different here and there from Airflow 2. This is entirely next level and we expect uh, Airflow 3 to scale to an entirely new level compared to what we had so far. And actually, this functionality you mentioned uh, will serve as a foundation for improvements in the duck parsing and processing space. So as we know, in Airflow 2, we have this resource CPU hungry uh, parsing loop that constantly goes over all your ducks, uh, reprocesses them, even if they were not changed since weeks or months, maybe. Uh, and that's a huge waste of, of uh, CPU that generates unnecessary load on the DB again. So with Airflow 3, what we want to do is introduce some controls. If you want to keep the loop, if you want to reprocess all your files all the time for compatibility reasons, or you know, maybe your setup depends on that, sure, you can do that. But maybe some directories in your DAG structure only need to be reparsed every day or every week, or maybe never and only when they are changed. So then we effectively achieve like on-demand DAC uh, parsing and processing that rhymes nicely with um, even driven uh, DAC execution, leading to this whole workflow useful in, in AI and, and other aspects. It seems like from a performance standpoint, as you mentioned, Airflow 3 is just going to look so different from Airflow 2 that there are aspects that can't even be compared necessarily because the way that Airflow 3 is performing these operations is just so different. What changes to that end? What changes to the scheduler can we expect going forward? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, so regarding the scheduler, I mean, I think, uh, or I should say, really for me, the most exciting one, as he mentioned, is the DAG parsing and making that really uh, something that is, like I said, uh, I think that's gonna be revolutionary. Some other changes to the scheduler, I mean, there, there's definitely gonna be performance optimizations to make sure that uh, we have a higher task throughput, that DAGs are launched more quickly and on demand. With the Gen AI inference use cases, people are going to expect a response pretty much immediately whenever they hit the API. Uh, so we are looking to as I said, improve the performance for this. Yeah, and I wonder, does that have, um, like our backfills gonna look any different in uh, Pro 3? Yes backfills, then backfills at scale. I mean, that's something that I'm super excited about as well. Uh, so as part of backfills at scale, it's going to be the scheduler that is managing the, um, the execution of backfills. And one of the main benefits of that is that we can introduce the concept of prioritization. So I mean, if you have a bunch of production DAGs that are running, and then somebody goes and tries to backfill three years worth of data, the last thing that you want is for these three years worth of data to cause missed LCLAs with my production ready DAGs. Uh, so by having the scheduler manage this, uh, that, that means that essentially they can go ahead and add those backfills whenever it makes sense without impacting your production workloads. Um, another bit of a shameless plug as well is that uh, by with the, the backfills at scale project, we are going to have proper endpoints uh, via the API. So you'll be able to execute backfills via the API. And we're also introducing some UI capabilities to be able to execute and manage backfills in bulk via the UI. Um, you know, I imagine you've all been there where if you have to go backfill, 
let's say a month worth of data, you're going and you're clearing each diagram one at a time. You will not have to do that anymore. Yeah, one thing I love about uh, backfills coming to scheduler is actually all the scheduling in Airflow 3 will happen in scheduler and yeah. not in you know, other places. Uh, and that opens up doors for even greater improvements in performance, introducing scheduler sharding perhaps, perhaps splitting the uh, dark directories again that are processed by different schedulers, different times. So I think the, this opens doors for evolution of the architecture into even more performant and distributed way. Yeah, backfills work today, but if you've seen Airflow's code, it's another scheduler of its own, and it's yeah. bad. It is a tech dead code that has been on forever. Um, and from the user side, you get zero visibility on the UI about your backfill run. That's That has been a pain. It's like, hey, if I want to run backfill, I need to run an Airflow backfill command. But the services I use don't provide me access to Airflow CLI. What the heck do I do? Run a bash operator, create an API, hack around it, and that's a terrible experience. It works, but that's a terrible experience. So this will be a first-class support for backfills that you'll be able to not only run it from UI, API, and everything, but you will have visibility of all those things in the UI. Well, and, and if it's if it's going to be anything like the improvements to the trigger DAG UI, then I'm incredibly excited for exactly. that. Exactly. Yep. And I think one question on day one somebody had asked that, can we actually deprioritize backfill jobs over our critical jobs which are running on schedule? It is not possible today, but what, as Mihao mentioned, it, the bringing backfill to the same core centralized scheduling logic would actually enable some of these use cases. So if you are looking to contribute and if you want to get benefit out of this change, then do reach out to the community and we'll help you build these features into Airflow. And this is one of those things that are in active development. So please do reach out uh, to myself or to Daniel Standish, who is somewhere in the conference. And we're happy, we'd be happy to hear some feedback about this. Yeah, and we'll, we'll be talking a little bit later about how participation in the community yeah. with Airflow 3 uh, can look. But lastly, I, I want to touch on some usability features. So um, multi-team management has been a core use case of Airflow for many years. Um, Shubham, how is this changing in Airflow 3? Thanks for asking. This is what keeps me <laughs> drinking coffee, I mean. But, okay, so here is my <laughs> pitch. Airflow has evolved over time, and we saw that when organizations actually adopted Airflow, it was not just one team that has started using Airflow. It, it became the centralized platform where all the data practitioners were building end-to-end -end workflows. So you will have data scientists coming in, and they would want to run their machine learning pipelines, you will have data engineers, data analysts, et cetera. So the use cases, like when organizations adopt, the use cases increase, the teams that are interacting with Airflow, they increase. But today, if you want to run a multi-team setup with Airflow, you're either left with a choice where you run one instance and you give everybody ro different roles, but roles kind of fool you. They give you the permission what you are seeing in the UI, but at the execution time, your task can go and do anything in the database. Like we always say, when whenever a customer issue comes in, security related issue, if you are a DAG author, you have an admin permission on Airflow today. The second option that people are doing to, today is running multiple instances. While that makes everything isolation and everything easy, it makes it very, very difficult to actually operate and scale because you now end up having with hundreds of environments that you need to manage. So what we are changing in Airflow 3 is introducing multi-team setup where team will be an ingrained part of Airflow and it will allow you to, from the, from the get-go where you're defining your configurations, you will have two levels of configurations. One, is, one will be configurations at the, at the com which are common at the environment level and then you will have team specific configurations where you want your metrics or logging to be separated out because you are on different teams, you don't want those logs to be visible. So that's one change. And then if when you're defining teams, you would be able to bring in your own DAG bundles, you would be able to bring in your own workers so that your tasks are isolated, but at the same time you will, with other teams, you will be sharing your, your scheduler, your web server, your database instance, so that you're not paying for those instances you're able to use those instances to share the cost with some other teams. And what we are envisioning is your data set will become the layer with which your different DAGs from different teams actually interact with each other. So 
I am a data engineer, I can produce some data set, and then, for example, I produce a data set for game, game telemetry, and then the data science team can use that data set or trigger workflows, depend on that data set, and trigger their workflows for machine learning pipelines based on that data set. So you will have isolation in terms of execution, in terms of what you're seeing in the UI, but still there will be a shared layer of data set which will allow you to actually build more complex pipelines where you have multiple teams interacting with each other. Thank you. We're running low on time, and I do want to give the, uh, the, the option to actually have some community questions here, but I want to try and touch on a few more things before before we do that. Um, Constance, can you share any more details about what we should expect with the new UI for Airflow 3? Yeah, absolutely. So this is another one of those things that I'm super excited about. Uh, so, you know, in Airflow 2, there, there's been a lot of work that, that's been done to modernize the UI and to move towards React-based components. And really, when I pull up a 1.10 or even a 2.0, I find it's jarring at how, how different it is. Uh, so with Airflow 3, uh, we're essentially going, now that we're fully at React, back to the drawing board and seeing really what we can do to modernize the UI. Uh, so as you see, we have some mocks, um, and if anybody has any feedback, please uh, come see me, come see Brent. Uh, but ultimately, we want to present information to you in a way that makes sense. So uh, what I'm, you're seeing over here is the new homepage uh, that we're thinking above, which gives you, instead of the DAGs list, it gives you information about what's going on with pipelines today. And we are, and what you also see is the DAGs list view. Now, obviously, it's every single page that's going to essentially get revamped as part of this. Um, the idea with the revamp is that we want, with Gen AI use cases, with event-driven use cases, we expect a lot more DAGs and a lot more tasks. Uh, so it becomes crucial to show that information to you in a way that makes sense. This is so exciting. <laughs> it's, it's been nice as someone who's been in the community just to see these changes roll through and upgrade my instance and like, wow, there's so many new features here. And this, so this is gonna be. I mean, really, I wanna give a big shout out to Brent and Pierre and other people because it, it, the, the amount of effort has been phenomenal throughout point two. Point two. Well, and speaking of upgrading, um, many of us, might have scars uh, from the Airflow 1.0 to 2.0 upgrade. Um, how will the 2 to 3 migrations look any different? So yeah, migrations are fun, and migration <laughs> from Airflow That's 1. That's a word for them, yes. Uh, yeah, you know, migration from Airflow 1 to Airflow 2 was in particular fun, uh, and we don't want that fun to happen again with Airflow 2 to Airflow 3. Uh, so two things. Uh, Based on that learnings, uh, we are making the ease, ease and smoothness of transition one of our top priorities when discussing Airflow 3. Uh, and actually, uh, we want the DAGs that are written, well-behaved DAGs, as, as, as Vikram <laughs> mentioned, you know, the DAGs written using standard Airflow functionalities, standard providers uh, that will be available still, compatible with both Airflow 2 and Airflow 3. Uh, to just work. So you would be able to just take your DAGs from Airflow 2 instance, drop them into Airflow 3. Unless you're doing something crazy, they should work. Uh, what will change a, a bit more is the experience of uh, sort of admin persona that sets up, sets up the deployment of uh, the Airflow instance, because architecturally, that will be a bit different, different platform. Uh, but for that, uh, we want to actually deliver a migration tool that will transform the Airflow 2 deployment into Airflow 3. So hopefully uh, the transition will be very smooth uh, and we'll see very rapid adoption of all these great features in community. Yeah, that upgrade tool for 1.0 to 2.0 was crucial for, for myself, and so it would be nice to see something similar to that. Yeah, now. the one thing you could all do right now if you're already on 2.8, 2.9, upgrade to 2.10 and see if there are any deprecations warning, already make plans for it. If you're using subdeg operator as an example, just remove it and utilize task group instead because that will be a breaking change with no, no backup. So utilize task group. Task group is a backup, but it's not an in-place replacement from a DAG authoring perspective, so. Since we're running low on time, I just wanna mention that uh, this is like just the start. A bunch of periphery features like authorization and SLAs will also be affected. Um, but uh, I would, be remiss, I've been told very explicitly that I have to ask about DAG versioning. So, <laughs> Axel, tell us about it. Hey, I was asked about it last year by Mark, and I unfortunately had to say there are plans, but I don't know about those plans yet. And when we'll do, we don't know. So this year, I'm very, very pleased to say DAG versioning will be part of 3.0. Jed over there is working very hard on it. 
uh, we already landed one of the pieces in 2.10 and all the other pieces will be uh, released in 3.0 and it's even better than we had originally visioned. Uh, we will have a concept of DAG bundles where you can fetch your DAGs from different sources. So you now no longer need to just put every DAG into a single DAG folder. Instead, you will be able to put some DAGs from let's say S3, GCS, wherever, um, and have all of them versioned. So in UI, you can be assured that whatever your DAG runs with, it will be shown as opposed to the latest version. So you will have the full end-to-end -end DAG versioning about that, but you'll also have the concept of DAG bundles where for multi-teams later on, uh, each team can probably own a different bundle. But if it's a single team and they're coming from multiple places, data analysts working on something else, uh, data engineers working on something else, you can utilize the DAG bundles over there. And this will be available via API as well. So you could register DAG bundles via API. Okay, before we move into the Q&A, um, it seems that we have an opportunity for folks to provide feedback uh, about Airflow 3 and um, the process and, and what. Yes, so there are a lot, as you can imagine, there are a lot of things happening with Airflow 3, but one of the things that a few folks from the community has done is created this Airflow debugging improvement survey. So if you have time, please, please fill this survey out. We are going to utilize this to improve Airflow's debugging experience, including DAG authoring experience. So this is your chance to tell us what we should do. And if you want to get involved with helping about this effort, you can join Airflow Slack. There's a specific channel created for this. Search for SIG uh, Airflow debugging channel. You will get there. There are folks working on this effort uh, right now. We already received like 50 responses even before the summit. So your responses will help. This is one part or one way of giving the feedback. There are other avenues. Uh, look at GitHub issue right now um, on Airflow repo. There is a GitHub issue for re releasing Airflow 3. If you want to get involved by contributing or giving feedback, you can do over there. And it also points to different links, like it defines the scope of the things that will be delivered in Airflow 3. So if you are interested in helping out on certain open items, you can do it there as well. And the, there's always the dev mailing list where you can pop in to say, hey, I'm happy with this or not happy with this, so. Well, Constance, Michal, Shubham, and Kaxel, I thank you so much for taking time today to explain and dive deep into these features. Thank you. Thank you very much thank for you. having me. Thank you.